All right, 1 Timothy chapter 2, page 1846, and let me read this section. And this is a chosen reading for the day because of one word that is in these verses, okay? St. Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings, all, in all those in authority, that we may live peaceful, quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. This is the word of our Lord. Now turn to Matthew chapter 20, page 1530. Okay, Matthew chapter 20, page 1530, and we're going to read these uh, two sections. Uh, Jesus is on his way up to Jerusalem, and for those of you who may not know, literally when the pilgrims made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they literally climbed the hill, the mountain. It was like 2,500 feet above sea level, so it was a climb. And the pilgrims also sang those songs. They had them memorized as they made the journey to the Passover. So let us read, okay? Beginning with verse 17, Jesus predicts his death again. Now, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Let's just stop there. We'll try something different this time. We'll come back to the next part. So. This is the third prediction Jesus makes to his disciples. And why does he have to do so so many times? Jesus takes them to the side. So he's away from the rest of the crowd and he put, gets them aside. That means he really wanted to tell them something important. Remember when you were a child and your mother or father took you aside to the upper room, the bedroom? Usually you were in trouble. But the reality is we take someone aside when we want their full attention, right? We do that. So the Jesus does that. So what was the deal? I, the disciples didn't understand, I don't think, the severity of what was about to happen. When we come to the second part, I think we'll have a little clue to what they were thinking. But they seemed to be totally out of sync with what Jesus was saying about his coming passion. And I don't know if they didn't believe it, if they didn't want to believe it, but personally, I think Think they had another idea of what his coming, his kingdom coming, when he comes into his kingdom, what that all meant. Totally different perception. So he takes them off to the side and he tells them the parts of his coming passion. I want to focus though on the term going up to Jerusalem. So Jesus is going up to Jerusalem to worship. He's going up to Jerusalem, his last journey, to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. But Jesus is doing much more than that. It's interesting, we should catch that gospel connection. He is going up to Jerusalem not just to celebrate the Passover. He is going to Jerusalem to be the Passover lamb who is sacrificed on the altar of the cross to pay for the sins of the world. 
Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. He knew what lay ahead for him. He knew what was coming. He knew the severity. And he went willfully, purposefully, not an accident or not a tragic accident of history. He went willfully up to Jerusalem knowing full well what was going to happen. And he went there to conform his life to the will of the Father to give up his life as the atoning sacrifice as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. That's the first going up to Jerusalem. But here's the second. The second going up to Jerusalem you and I experience in our lives. I'm sure most of us have experienced, we wouldn't call them our Jerusalems, but really we do. We have those moments where we have to climb, if you will, the hill, and we know there's going to be what? Suffering, there's going to be sacrifice, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be painful. You ever gone through some of those? Yes. Things like cancer, the death of a loved one, difficulties at home, financial problems, dealing with other people. I'm in the middle of a, a reconciliation right now, and that's a mountain for me. Those are those times where you're walking up and you know it's hard and you really don't want to do it, right? You really don't want to have to go through this problem, but you know that you have to because it's the right thing to do and you're willing to sacrifice whatever that means for the good and for others, yes? So I want to say to you, when you face your Jerusalems, going up to Jerusalems, whatever that may be, of sickness, personal issues, and finally your own death, you can rejoice. Just like we can rejoice in, in Lent. Lent is not a time of mourning. Lent is a time of reserved joy, if you will. I think we Lutherans wrestle with Lent. And if you remember Lent as a kid, it was always what? Dreary. At least in Buffalo, New York, when it was, the snow was melting and everything was dirty. And, but the reality is, you know, even in those going up to Jerusalem's in our lives, we can find joy. We can find peace and, and knowing the Father is with us. That's number two, going up to Jerusalem. The third, going up to Jerusalem, is you and I are on the road to our final destination. And truthfully, folks, you are and I are journeying that road uh, that will lead us to the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the holy city of God in the kingdom of glory. Last week, a woman said to me, my favorite hymn, she said, is I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. And I want to remind you of that. Your life has a plan. God has a plan for you. And you're on that road. You're on that journey. And I want to say to you, enjoy the journey. Okay? I remember one woman said, I'll be happy, Pastor, when I die. Wow. <laughs> wow. I don't remember who that was. Thank you, Lord, and I don't remember. But, yeah, I'll be happy when I die. What a terrible way to live. You should enjoy the journey knowing all along that whatever happens, whatever Jerusalems you have to climb here, there's one Jerusalem that you don't earn. But the Lord will give that to you as a His gift. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so that Jerusalem, Jerusalem the Golden, you know, they're in glory. I asked someone the other day how long her husband has been gone. And I thought about it afterwards, and you know, I'm going to change my question, because I ask that question periodically. I'm going to say, how long has your husband been in glory? How long has he been in the kingdom, in the new Jerusalem? So today, folks, I want to remind you of that. We have that ahead of us. The, the end of our road doesn't end in death. Notice this connection. Just as Jesus was on the road up to Jerusalem, it didn't end in death. It ended in life on Resurrection Sunday. So your road to the heavenly Jerusalem does not end in death. It ends in the gift of eternal life and the resurrection of the body. 
part two of the sermon. Let's read the next section. By the way, these sections are connected. Okay? You ready? Read with me. Verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Well, what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so for you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. So I think these two are very much connected because they have the same themes. So the, the, mother, the mother is Salome, we believe. And she was the brother or the mother of James and John. We also tend to believe that Salome may have been a sister to Mary. So this could have been a family thing. What is happening here? I think Jesus is confused and disappointed. Here he's on one track, and all they're worried about is the places of honor. So if it's true that these are his close, his relatives, what are they doing? The answer I have is, I think they expected that Jesus' kingdom would come, would come on this trip to Jerusalem. I think they had the idea, we're going, something big's going to happen. And they had no clue what was going to happen. But they knew something was going to happen. And they just wanted to make sure that they were on the right and his left when the glory came to establish an earthly messianic kingdom. If you remember the disciples at the Mount of Ascension, remember that? They asked him again, will you at this time what? Restore the kingdom to Israel. I think that's what lies behind this. The mother comes humbly. She bows down. She kneels down and says, could you do this for my boys? And Jesus, he must be pulling out his hair. And then, of course, the ten get angry. Yeah, of course, right? So what does Jesus have to do again? He pulls them aside. You know, I'm sure at times he was so frustrated. And he gives them now, let me tell you the way it's going to be, the new way for the new deal and the new day. All right? You're this, I love that phrase, not so with you. The ways of the world, the power and authority that we experience in governments. And we do. We live under the authority of government. And we've got it good. We actually get to elect the people who are leaders of this land. Many nations, they live with tyrants. And they have nothing to say. But Jesus says, that's the way it is in this world. But this is not the way it is to be in the new kingdom of God. Greatness in the kingdom of God is measured again by what? Service and sacrifice not by power and authority. And this people of God is hard for us. Because by nature, we do not want to sacrifice. By nature, we want to be what? Served, not to serve. I mean, think of this in the kingdom of God. How many people sitting in pews on Sunday morning, their primary concern is about me? Maybe not. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but I got to believe that a lot of folks are concerned about me, what I like, what, what, what hits my fancy. 
And the reality is, folks, the greatness in the kingdom is not about you. It's not about me. Greatness is measured by service, humble service, whether we are rewarded or recognized or not. And I want to say to you, and that's why these two are fit together, it is his Jesus sacrifice, our sacrifice for others, and also now this one, to serve, to become as a slave, to become as someone as our Lord has become. And that's so hard for us, but I want to invite you to live that way. The world standard is set aside. God's standard in his kingdom is one of service. Not what I get out of it. Not what makes me happy. But what is the benefit to others? Others are first. Jesus' kingdom is first. Ministry is first. Service is first. And, you know, thank God that for us who have had children, we understand that, don't we? And we can apply that in our lives. But again, it doesn't come to us naturally. This whole thing ends with one of the great powerful gospel verses in the Bible, where Jesus says, Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's our model. And you know as well as I that one of the great issues we all deal with is the issue of pride. And that gets in the way of serving. So, you know what the word ransom is? Ransom is the payment one makes to release an, a, a slave in bondage. That's what, that's the picture behind the word. So if you, there was a slave and you are in bondage, you would pay this price and he, he or she would be released. Our Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for your release from the slavery of sin. Not with gold or silver, as Luther would say, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.